From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading date as Monday, May 9th. Here are the top market stories that we are following for you at this hour. The S&P's tipping point. Equity markets slammed approaching that 4,000 mark. Could this trigger a max exodus from equities? We're going to break down the technicals. Investors flee some stocks. And dollar dominance. Dollar jumping as safe haven of choice. While Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic backs up the Fed chair, advocating for just 50 basis point rate increases. Insurance headache. Allstate bets on higher rates to customers as inflation hurts earnings. We're going to speak to the CEO, Tom Wilson. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. It is a pleasure to be back, Guy. It's been 15 very long weeks, and it is very good to see you. It is fantastic to see you. You have been missed uh, every day we played that opening sequence that we just saw, Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. So you've been in our thoughts every day, Alex. Uh, and it is so fantastic to have you back. Um, and, and we've got so much to talk about. I, your journey, I think, over those last 15 weeks, and we're going to talk about the details in just a moment, folks. Uh, I think there's lessons in all of this for all of us. So it is, it is, let me just say, from the whole team, from everybody, it is great to have you back, and we're going to look after you uh, and make sure that your transition back into work is as easy as possible. Um, so let's get on with that work and talk a little bit about what is happening today. We've got data that is breaking. We're going we're to go to Alex's story in, in the next block and talk more about it because I think actually what Alex has been through is relevant to what is happening in the US labour market right now in particular uh, and for the whole of society. So let's talk about the data we're getting right now. Wholesale inventories month on month, uh, 2.3, bang in line with expectations. The trade sales number, 1.7. Companies, Alex, are continuing to build inventories understandably considering the problems we continue to have with the trade story around the world. So that's the data right now, but markets firmly in focus. Yeah, and all of that really leading to the question uh, of the day, what's below 4,000 for the S&P 500? What kind of washout are we going to see if we break below that? Uh, Katie Stockton is founder and managing partners of Fairlead Strategies, and we kind of wanted to get the technical take of that. Katie, if you break below 4,000, what's next? Great, Alex. Well, welcome back to you. Um, essentially, we have already seen a breakdown by the S&P 500 index, and the level that I was watching was actually 4,200. So 4,000 to me is basically a foregone conclusion at this point. The 4,200 level was based on three different technical factors, one being a Fibonacci retracement level, and those are very common ways to discern support on the charts. Now, unfortunately, with this confirmed breakdown that we received for, by the S&P, the support level based on those same Fibonacci retracements is roughly 38.15. And we use support levels as a gauge of downside risk. Now, they're not really predictive in a way, but they do show an area of potential buying pressure in a chart. So we believe that with the breakdown that it does increase risk, perhaps to that 38.15. But along the way, we'll always be looking for signs of downside exhaustion that are more than just short term in nature. Michael Hartnett, Katie, over at Bank of America, says the average in for most people since the start of 2021 is 42.74. And you get below 4,000 and a trap door opens. I, I, I hear what you're saying about the fact that actually the key level's already broken. But how significant is 4,000 to a lot of people out there? A lot of people obviously bid this market up a long way. Dipping below 4,000 could be a big line in the sand for them. Yeah, I mean, it's a round number, right? And anything that has that kind of like influence on market sentiment, it is a big deal just by the nature of that just being a round number. And in the same way, you know, 10 year treasury yields clearing 3%, these are all big hurdles on the charts. And when you take a step back and you look at the S&P 500 index for one, with 4,000, 4,200, whatever it may be being taken out, it starts to look like a, a topping formation. We like to call it a head and shoulders. You know, it's a pretty common technique term and essentially it's just showing a lower high that's reflecting a loss of long-term upside momentum so it's something that's not new to the market 
Uh, the breakdown, of course, happens after you've already seen that loss of momentum that is pretty meaningful. We actually started to see it late last year in our indicators. If you look at the monthly bar charts, we had things from an overbought oversold perspective that started to flash sell signals. And then also we saw this downtick in momentum that still, of course, is with the market. So momentum right now is unfortunately to the downside across timeframes. We would expect it to ultimately improve short term. And yet what we're seeing from the market right now is a non-reaction to oversold conditions. And we take issue with that. That does reflect usually a downtrending market. So we're going to assume that this downtrend is going to keep hold uh, in the coming months. So does that mean that any kind of rally you want to be selling rips at any point in any asset? Yeah, we've been recommending that folks be hedged from a top-down perspective. What you do see when the market's going lower is that most everything participates in the downside. There's very, very few places to hide. So we're, we're encouraging people to sell strength, just like you say, especially to stocks that have broken support levels of their own, of which there are many. In fact, about a review of the S&P 500, we found that about 70% of the stocks in the S&P 500 had downside intermediate term momentum. It's, it's pretty high. And of course, that just makes it so much harder to take advantage of any upside. It just means that a lot of these stocks are trending lower. So anytime that someone's putting on a, a long position, it is effectively counter trend. Of course, we don't want to have to sell everything. So keeping some core yep. exposure is usually the right thing to do. But then you can manage around that by putting on these hedges. Kenny, talk to me about the NASDAQ. 20% down already, plus um, it's already in a bear market. How different does the picture look, if at all? It's really quite similar, but what I would suspect is that the NASDAQ 100 index would underperform with additional downside in the same way that it has done recently. And, and I say that in part because we believe that the mega caps really they haven't fallen terribly out of favor collectively, especially with the help of Apple, which has been a relative uh, sort of outperformer, I would say. And, and with Apple, if Apple sort of cracks, that's obviously going to have a bigger negative impact on the NASDAQ 100 than the S&P 500, given its footprint in Apple. So we also are watching the support levels there. So with the 13,000 area having been taken out decisively, the next support area for the NASDAQ 100 is roughly another 18 to 20% lower. So we're, we're watching 10,600. It doesn't mean that it will see that kind of downside follow through, but it does hint at greater risk. Uh, so talking about relative outperformance, that brings me to value. And I wonder when you look at the charts, how much can value outperform growth? And I'm going to put, you know, air quotes uh, on all of that. You know, we are, we're always looking for relative performance, too, and, and we would expect value to outperform in a more defensive tape, typically. We, we like to have exposure to defensive sectors that's overweight in this kind of environment uh, while still reducing overall equity exposure period. So uh, with a value orientation of some of these more defensive sectors and sectors like financials, which couldn't have been considered as as stretched, say, as technology, which of course is more heavy in growth. Yep. Um, you know, those areas of the market should outperform. Katie, what's the canary in the coal mine for you right now? Where are you looking for a lead indicator? Oh gosh, well, there's a lot of things. I wish there was a simple answer to that. But what we tend to look for in terms of identifying a tradable low would be, of course, number one, support discovery, looking for momentum to start to shift. It doesn't have to shift fully, but some early indications of that. Sometimes that appears on the charts in positive divergences in the indicator. So let's say we see a higher low in an indicator that we're tracking as price is finding its footing. So that's a type of thing that we look for. We look for oversold buy signals. We look for a loss of downside momentum, generally speaking, and then things like on a short term basis, like outside updates. So you can see it's a combination of factors that we're looking for to suggest that a low is in place. And usually those lows are put in when sentiment is just awful. And I have to say, as much as we all feel uh, the pain of the recent market, it, it's sentiment, at least by transactional measures, is not quite as bearish as you would expect it would be. Okay. Uh, I, I hear that. That's not how it feels, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, feels like it feels like a pretty rough tape out there now, at the moment, Katie, but maybe there's worse still to come. Always oh, nice to get some good news on a Monday. Katie Stockton, great to catch up. Really appreciate the time. Katie Stockton, a fair lead strategies founder and managing partner over there. As we speak, the S&P just dipping a little bit further, 40-41, obviously.
we continue to watch that 4,000 mark. But Casey kind of taking us away from that a little bit. Uh, OK, what have we got coming up? More signs that uh, we are at risk of a bear market. In Harnett's Absolute Strategy Research Chief Investment Strategist is going to be joining us next. It's going to be fascinating to hear he was, how he is viewing this market. More downside to come. We'll find out next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. If you've been keeping score, it has been 15 weeks since I have sat in this anchor chair. And the markets have moved insanely quickly uh, over those last 15 weeks, Guy. I wanted to pull this little comparison here that showed where the S&P, uh, the dollar, the tenure, and oil were on my last day in the office versus where they are now. I cannot believe that I missed a 30% plus move in the yeah. oil market. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, I have to say, the, so Alex, Commodities have been front and centre, so you definitely mixed, uh, missed out on, on what has been an incredible story. We ha I, I think that every day we have talked about commodities, um, and it's, it, has been, it, it has been a wild ride. Kayleigh Lines, I know, is watching, has sat in that chair uh, for while, you, while you've been away, keeping it warm, uh, and, and huge thanks to her. But what, what she has said on, at the beginning of every month is, and she said it again at the beginning of this month, is... I can't quite make up my mind whether or not I'm saying, I can't quite believe it's May, I, we're already sort of so far through the year, or I can't but quite believe it's only May, because <laughs> it has been an incredibly bumpy ride since the start of the year. Every day has just felt like you're being whipsawed. I, I think we've all got stiff necks, basically from oh. the start of the year. And I feel exactly the same way, even though my journey has been a bit different. I just want to sort of fill in our viewers a little bit about what's been going on with me. I am triple vax with the COVID vaccine. I did get COVID at the end of January when my daughter brought it home from school. And since then, I've been dealing with severe brain fog and fatigue. So it has really taken a village to get me back in this seat today. And I deeply thank my team and Guy uh, for being so supportive. It is a it's a long road, and it's still a work in progress. I'm still not 100%. Don't know what I'm going to be like in 10 minutes. Don't know what I'll be like tomorrow. But I really do appreciate uh, the support. And, Guy, what has made me think a lot about, and I mean this sincerely, is I work in a company that has incredibly supportive staff and yep. inc incredibly supportive policies, and there are a lot of people that don't. And there have to be millions of people dealing with this. And I tell you, it is severely debilitating. And I just really have to wonder what this economy and labor market is going to look like in five to ten years when people really come to terms with what the long-term effects are uh, from COVID. Well, I, th I think we saw that on Friday, Alex. Um, everybody was expecting the participation number to go up. It is not. People are not coming back to the labor market. In fact, the question I posed Friday is, where is everybody? Why are people not coming back into the labor market? And I think what you've just laid out just encapsulate some of the problems and the experiences and the difficulties that people are having right now. They're either looking after somebody that has, that has had COVID, got long COVID, got medical issues stemming from COVID, or they're worried about putting themselves in a position where they may catch it. And you saw the debate over the weekend between Anthony Fauci and the White House and what was going on there about what happened uh, at the correspondence dinner, like thousands of people getting together the possibility of big numbers still further down the road cannot be ignored. So I think a lot of people are still very nervous, and I think that's keeping a lot of people out of the labour market right now. So I think, that to your point, the long-term effect is going to be multi-pronged, and we're going to have to think about it from lots of different angles. And talking about one of them, that's the medium-term, maybe long-term outlook, really. And the day-to-day -day is still just as volatile for me and for the markets, which brings us back, Guy, to the question of the day. What's below 4,000 for the S&P? Well, Ian Harnett, Absolute Strategy Research Chief Investment Strategist, joins us now on set, which is a very good and well-deserved surprise for me. Um, Ian, what is below 4,000 for you? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be your first guest on, uh, on set, uh, Alex, and it's always a pleasure to work with you and Guy. So, you know, I think we're at an absolutely crucial point now. Your previous guest was talking about some of the short-term technical points. But if you go down to the next technical point, it had been such a nice run-up. The 200-day moving average is right the way down around the 3,500 area. So, you know, that is the kind of risk that we've got here. And one of the things I was looking at this morning is that, you know, people are saying, oh, well, after this kind of correction that we've had, 16% down from the peak, you know, surely this is a buying opportunity already. But have a look at equities versus bonds in the last three months. Equities are still up 
relative to mm. bonds or pretty flat relative to bonds in the last three months. The real buying opportunities come when we're much lower than that. And so our models are still saying that this is a bear market signal for equities versus bonds, and we want to stay out of it. And potentially, either those bond yields have to come down a long way, or the equity market probably will test that 3,500 level. And that's a pretty shocking number. Ian, great to see you. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us in New York. What do you think about cash right now? A lot of people keep telling me that you don't want to be in cash because you're taking the, the inflation hit. But what you're not do is doing is taking the absolute hit yeah. of being in the market. Um, and, and this is what I really don't understand uh, about this whole argument. If I stay in the market and I stay invested and I stay broadly invested, I'm going to see a relative hit from inflation and I'm going to see an absolute hit because the market is going to be declining. Do you just want to be in cash? Guy, you're absolutely right. You know, so cash has an attraction all of its own in that kind of environment. In this kind of environment, you can see what you've lost against the bond market, you know, uh, you know, in the bond market and in the equity market. So you know, we've been overweight cash in our portfolio that we've been recommending to clients and also overweight alternative assets like commodities generally. Although I'm beginning to get very concerned about that. I'd prefer to be in real estate rather than, than commodities on the industrial side of real estate. But yeah, cash has a real attraction at this stage given what we're concerned about. But we'd say it's actually now time to get back into bonds. With those Treasury yields right. back over 3%, you know, I think there's real attraction in the bond market, particularly if, as we think, economic growth is going to go from a synchronised global uh, slowdown to a recession, and we are going to see break-evens coming down aggressively as earnings get crunched in the next six months. I mean, I've heard that too, that uh, you're seeing bond ETFs start to attract yeah. some kind of uh, hedging flow uh, due to that. Um, so where do you do, what do you do with the dollar then? Well, I think that one of the issues for the global economy here, Alex, and one of the reasons why we worry that this is a global slowdown is that dollar strength. All the while the U.S. continues to grow faster than the rest of the world, the upward bias for the dollar is there. So we think the dollar's still got further upside, but that's one of the problems that causes issues for the global economy and one of the things that causes problems for those earnings outlooks. So I'd still stay long the dollar. I'd still be very nervous, therefore, about international markets and about EM particularly. You know, it's still too early to buy those emerging market equities. Ian, can I just take you back to the bond market for a second and just talk about the different durations that are on offer here? Yeah. If, if we are, and we're going to get the inflation data later this week from Germany, from the US, if we're getting near peak inflation, if bonds are starting to look attractive, which bonds in particular? Do I want to be, for instance, buying the front end because actually maybe that move's gone too far uh, and selling, the, selling duration? How do, how do I want to play that from a curve point of view? So I think the bottom line is that we think the whole curve is going to come down here, Guy. You know, if you've got a situation where economic growth coming down is going to see... Uh, you know, we think that people's expectations of the Fed futures have gone too far. It's interesting illustrative that I think over the weekend we haven't really seen much change, even though the 30-year picked up quite a long way. I, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to see duration win out. If break-evens come down, if oil prices come down, commodity prices come down as we anticipate, then you are going to see that back end of the curve come down as well. I think the other thing that I would say is that some of our models are painting an awful picture for the Eurozone. We're talking about earnings growth down in the Eurozone 20% year on year, and you know, I think Bunts are a great buy here. So you know, that's going to be another area that we'd be looking at aggressively. Ian, great to catch up. Great to see you in New York. Thank you very much indeed for spending some time with us. Ian Hunnett, Absolute Strategy Research Chief investment strategist. Uh, OK, let's turn our attention to what is happening with geopolitics. Vladimir Putin invoking the World War II fight against Nazi Germany to justify the invasion of Ukraine. We're going to break that down next. This is Bloomberg. So... The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, tried to justify his faltering invasion of Ukraine a little earlier as a battle comparable to the fight against Nazi Germany. He spoke at the annual Victory Day celebration in Red Square, which marks the defeat of Germany in 1945.
NATO countries didn't want to listen to us, and in fact, what happened, they had completely different plans, and we can see it today. And they openly prepared the operation in Donbass and the invasion of our historical lands, including Crimea. He talks a lot about the Donbass region. Obviously, that is where the heaviest fighting is right now. Joining us now to discuss Bloomberg's Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern. Amory, he didn't label it as a war, which a lot of people are citing as being significant. If he had done, it would have led to a mass mobilization. It was a more subdued speech than many had anticipated. How is it being received in DC? Yeah, certainly more subdued. I mean, many thought, as you say, Guy, he was going to label this a war. There could have been a mass mobilization. He didn't even mention the country, Ukraine. And it does look like he is really trying to focus and laser focus in on the Donbass region. We should note that this 10 weeks of this invasion, Russia still has not been able to fully capture a single city. Their biggest triumph is Mariupol, and yet it is still not fully in Russian hands. So what you saw from President Vladimir Putin is a very different speech than what he would have likely wanted to give pre-invasion, which when he thought it was going to be a very swift capture of Ukraine. But we should note this is a really important day for not just Putin, but the Russian people. Um, and they celebrate it every year and they mark it every year because 27 million Soviets died during World War II. And he's using this rhetoric to try to make this comparison, which we know is not true, between World War II and what is going on in Ukraine. And as President Zelensky made clear in his address today, many of those were Ukrainians. Um, Anne-Marie, the, the view from Washington increasingly feels like it's we need to degrade Russia's war machine. So not only can they not fight in Ukraine, but they can't fight elsewhere. Can you just talk me through how that is taking shape? Well, we heard as well from the Deputy Treasury Secretary this morning basically saying just that. They're going after the uh, infrastructure of not just the entire economy to fund the war, but also the military and making sure that there's export controls on technology and the likes and things that Russia would continuously need, Guy, to continue this yep. war or potentially invade other countries. Absolutely. We'll talk more about this in the next hour. Amory Hordern joining us from the White House. Thank you very much indeed. Right, coming up, Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic says half-point hikes are already pretty aggressive. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. hour into the U.S. trading session, and it is getting very ugly. We're now down by about 90 points for the S&P. Kriti Gupta of Bloomberg is here tracking some of those moves. Hey, Kriti. Yeah, Alex, let's talk about the sea of red that we're seeing. The selling, it's indiscriminate, but there is some nuances I really want to point to, uh, point to out to our audience here, and that, of course, is the energy index down almost 5% on this day. Remember, energy has kind of been this inflation hedge, this defensive trade to some extent, what tech used to be uh, post-pandemic, and now you're actually seeing that trade flipped a little bit. So the, na or the information technology index, for example, which has really been leading the decline over the last couple of weeks. It's actually outperforming to some extent the energy index, and that's going to be something to keep in mind. Let's take a look at what sectors are actually officially in bear markets now. As we see the NASDAQ, 25 percent lower from its high, but that isn't the case for all of the sectors. You, of course, see the S&P 500 down 50 percent of its members down 20 percent. But if you just look at energy, utility staples, the outperformers lately, we're not quite there yet. Perhaps that's why the energy sector is actually underperforming today. And remember, a lot of traders are saying this isn't a question about fundamentals driving the selling. It's about just returning to normal valuations. So one trader told me, for example, the S&P 500 now will likely go back to trading to a 16 or 18 PE multiple instead of the 20 to 21. And that might actually be a driver for more selling. Let's talk about what's actually doing well today. And that, of course, is the dollar. Green on the screen, that dollar strength continues. But the problem here is, does that make the stock market that we were just talking about a little less accessible for foreigners, that's going to be something we're really going to be watching, Guy. Yeah, and really expensive for me to come to New York. Kriti, thank you very much indeed. Kriti Gupta uh, on what is happening with the markets. The S&P, 31 points now away from the 4,000 mark. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's president, Rafael Bostic, says inflation still too high. 
and the Fed needs to act decisively to take control of that narrative. But he makes it clear that there are limits to what the Fed is prepared to do here. Raphael Bostic spoke in an exclusive interview a little earlier with Bloomberg's Mike McKee. You know, when I think about our policy, the first thing that is on my mind is that inflation is too high. And we need to act definitively and purposefully to, to try to get that under control. And I think if you look at what we've, what we've done so far in the last two meetings, we've really started that process. For me, 50, 50 basis points from you know, over the last 20 years, you know is already a pretty aggressive move. I don't think we need to be, be moving even more aggressively. I think we can stay at this, at this uh, pace and this cadence and really see how the markets evolve. Uh, my expectation and hope really is that uh, as we move closer to our neutral uh, levels uh, and far away from our accommodative stance, uh, that we're going to start to see a lot of the, 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 the tightness and the tension in the economy start to moderate, which can then give us options and choices as to sort of what we do after that point. How far do you go? Where do you think you'll be by, say, the end of the year and by the end of 2023? Well, you know, that's a very good question. I really think we need to be getting somewhere into the neutral range. And, and as you know, um, different people have different ideas about what that looks like. For me, I'm looking somewhere between two and two and a half percent as our neutral range. Uh, and then, we, then let's just wait and see what's happening. Um, you know, in the, in the intro to this segment, a lot of discussions about uh, uncertainty, or Seth Carpenter uh, ref was referenced, he's going to be here, I'm really excited about that, uh, saying that there's a, a lot of volatility, a lot of stuff that's going to play out. So once we get to that neutral level, I think that'll be fine. Um, we're going to, in my view, we're going to move a couple times, uh, maybe two, maybe three times, see what happens, see how the economy responds, uh, see if inflation continues to move closer to our 2% target. And then we, we can really take a pause, I think, and, and look at how things are going. Well, take a pause. What does that mean? Not move at a meeting, or would this be just a rolling decision as you go along? So for me, I think all options are on the table at every meeting. So depending on how the economy is responding, uh, it could be that the economy is responding strongly, so we don't need to do anything. It could be that the, the economy is, is responding uh, maybe a little less strong, so we might move to 25 basis points, or we may stay at 50. So I'm, I'm really going to keep my, my mind open. I'm going to observe what happens in the economy and then adapt my idea about what uh, appropriate uh, policy looks like uh, based on that knowledge. A lot of economists and many of your colleagues have said you're going to have to go beyond neutral uh, to restrictive. If you had a 4% inflation rate, and a 3% Fed funds rate, you've still got a negative real Fed funds rate. Uh, why don't you think that you're going to have to do that? Well, my hope is that a lot of the things that are really out of our control, things like supply chain disruptions and the like, are going to start to get to a better place. Uh, we're going to see how uh, the labor market responds. There's, uh, there was a story just last week about retirees coming back into the workplace. Those are things that might relieve some of the tension that we're seeing in labor markets and allow producers to start to increase the supply, their supply of products that then reduces the imbalance between demand and supply because all of this inflation is about an imbalance between uh, the high demand and the low supply that's out there. So if we can start to see movement on the supply side, uh, that means we'll have to push less on demand. And so that inflation, I'm hoping, will come down. Uh, now, how fast? We'll have to see, and that will really determine uh, whether we have to get into restrictive territory and if we do, how far. But I'm totally open to that, but you know, I'll just say, we've been doing surveys throughout the entire pandemic, Every one has come with predictions that have turned out not to be the case. So I'm going to try to be as humble as I can, be really just true to being in the moment, and try not to anticipate too many steps out in advance because uh, there's just a lot of stuff that's going to happen. As Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic speaking to Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Mike joins us now. Mike, I come back, you go to Florida without a tie. I, I don't really know what's happening anymore. Um, but I, I want to focus on what Bostic was saying about the neutral rate. In some ways, his neutral rate target is lower than the markets. And I guess my question is, how much higher is the Fed going to have to go above neutral and how quickly? Well, there is a lot of dispute about that, Alex. I might mention that uh, Raphael Bostic himself told me not to wear a tie, so I do what the host <laughs> says. But, 
Uh, we were out at the Hoover conference uh, uh, last, late last week, and the consensus there seemed to be you're going to have to go above three, maybe to four, and of course you've got the outliers like uh, uh, Larry Summers who's saying five or six percent, because you need to get real rates up. And if you have four percent inflation by the end of the year, as the Fed forecasts, and you have the Fed at two to two and a half percent, you've still got negative Fed funds real rates. So uh, they're probably going to have to go farther than they anticipate, but they'll be keeping an eye on all the numbers that come out. We do get CPI on Wednesday, PPI on Thursday, import prices Friday this week, and also Friday we get the University of Michigan numbers on what Americans think inflation is going to be. So there's uh, going to be a lot of debate over the next couple of days and a lot of volatility in the markets as people try to figure out just how yep. hard uh, they're going to have to hit it. Mike, can I just talk a little bit about that inflation number and maybe get a sense of where Bostick kind of feels we're going here? Just mechanically, it's likely that we're going to start to see inflation coming back down again. The question is, how quickly does it come back down again and to what level? And is there a sense at the Fed as to whether or not what is currently priced into the markets is going to be enough to bring us down to target? I don't know where the Fed wants to go on inflation. I'm assuming it's target, but I don't know. Well, there's kind of two ways to look at that. One is that uh, Bostic thinks that if nothing changes, we're going to be seeing inflation come down, uh, not just mechanically, but because some of the things that went up during the pandemic are going to be coming down again. We're already seeing that with used car prices. At the same time, there's so much unknown out there, and he, like other Fed members, is emphasizing that if we see energy prices rise significantly now uh, from where we even are at the moment, then you're going to have a problem with inflation that then could get into the core rate. If uh, diesel prices continue to rise, then that's going to raise shipping costs and that'll flow into the economy. So there's a lot they don't know at this point, and they're they can only kind of make the policy or uh, decide where they are by looking at where they are at the moment. And uh, it's kind of hard to know what's going to be happening down the line. California, then Florida. Mike McKee getting all the great gigs. Mike, thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Um, OK, Mike, we'll have another exclusive interview coming up. They just keep on coming. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester is going to be talking to Mike. Really looking forward to that conversation as well. Coming up, we're going to turn our attention to what this all means. insurance to combat inflation. Used car prices are higher. You want to fix a car, it's more expensive. There's a whole range of factors in the mix here. We're going to talk to the company's CEO, Tom Wilson. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rich Kagupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Terry Spath, the Zuma Wealth founder and CIO, joining Bloomberg Television, 3.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rich Kagupta. The U.S. government had a record tax haul this spring, and some of the credit goes to the surge in individual stock trading by Americans. According to Treasury Department data, tax collections since the start of the fiscal year in October are running at a record high, up some 43% over the same period in 2019. That surprised Wall Street and is shrinking the budget deficit. President Biden will give a speech Tuesday on his efforts to fight inflation. Rising prices are threatening the Democrats' already slim chances of holding on to Congress after the midterm elections. The president will draw a contrast between his proposals and a plan by Florida Senator Rick Scott to raise taxes and let Social Security and Medicare expire. Global News 24 hours today on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rich Kagupta. This is Bloomberg, Guy. Rick, thank you very much. Indeed, let's turn our attention to the insurance industry. All states reporting first quarter earnings that missed estimates. The insurance company identified as inf inflation, basically, as the main culprit. Uh, there have been more accidents, apparently, as well. But the main problem here is that used car prices are very high. And if you want to fix a car, parts are very expensive as well. As a result of which, the company posted uh, a combined ratio, which is a key measure for the ins insurance industry, north of 100, coming through at 102. Joining us now is Allstate CEO Tom Wilson. Tom, great to see you on the programme today. What we're all trying to understand right now is 
how long does the current state of affairs last for? How long do car prices stay high? How long do parts stay high? You obviously got a huge vested interest in this. What can you tell us about what you see coming next? Well, good morning, Guy uh, and Alex. Uh, nice to see you back on the, in the game. Um, it, we think inflation is going to stay for a while, so we've had to adapt. So we've both reduced our expenses, raised prices, and changed the way we invest. But I'd like to think of inflation, it's almost like the pig going through a python. You know, the python's the economy, it swallows the pig, it takes a long time for it to get through there. So as you point out what happened, you got chip shortages, there's uh, new cars, not as many new cars being built, a lot of money in the economy, used car prices are up 40%, uh, and, uh, and then it costs more to fix them, and then so we have to raise our prices. Same thing happens to housing, same thing happens to oil, and next thing you know, people are increasing their wages because they don't have enough money to live on. So we think it takes a while to go through the economy. Uh, Tom, great to see you. Also, that analogy probably made my day, uh, the pig and the python. So I guess the question is, um, how high do you have to increase your rates to offset this sort of slow-moving, very large inflation impact? Well, um, so far we're up 6.5% in the last six months, and we think we'll have to go up higher from there. And, of course, the reason is because if your car used to be worth $20,000 and now it's worth $28,000 and it gets wrecked or we need to fix it, we have to charge more money. Uh, to, we have to pay more money to get it fixed, uh, and we, we, can't <clears throat> we have to find a way to recover those costs. Do you think some of your competitors are going to continue to raise prices? I'm just wondering kind of how much switching you're going to see, how competitive the market is in ter terms of people shopping around. People are shopping around for everything right now, Tom. It it's groceries, yes. it's gasoline, it's everything. How do you see that working out? Uh, I think, well, first, our, everybody's got the same issue. Uh, all the uh, auto insurers, even the home insurers, same thing. Not as bad as in cars, but uh, in automobiles. Prices are going up. Everybody's raising up. People will shop more, which is why we built what we call transformative growth, which is really trying to build a digital insurer on top of what's an analog company that we digitize. So we're trying to reduce our expenses. We have a product called MileWise, where um, if you don't drive much, so if you drive less than 10,000 miles, you should be buying MileWise. Pay for it by the mile, not by the month. Um, Tom, I I'd love you to put another hat on as well. Uh, you previously served on the board of the Chicago <clears throat> Fed, so I wonder if you could sort of conflate uh, those two jobs. And when you're taking a look at demand destruction, for example, which is basically what the Fed has to see in order for inflation to come down, from the CEO seat, what's it going to take to get that kind of demand destruction where people stop buying used cars, where they stop uh, replacing old parts? Well, it's going to take a while, as I said. I, I don't think this is the kind of thing we can expect uh, two or three rate hikes in nine months are going to make a difference. It's going to take a while for it to work through the economy, so I think you have to be patient. I think the markets have to be patient with it. Uh, and what you're seeing out of that, of course, is interest rates are gone way up, which is why we changed our investing late last year. Uh, and you're seeing it in equity prices, too. As those two things change, I think the economic activity will follow, but it's going to take a time. It's not going to, like, they're not going to raise rates and people are going to stop investing in plants yeah. uh, or stop buying goods. It'll take a while. Can I just take you back to the kind of pay-as-you-go model? Do you see any evidence that people are driving less because of high gasoline prices? A little bit, uh, but you have first say, why do people drive? So about a third of the time you're driving to work, a third of the time you're driving to do errands, and about a third of the time you're driving for entertainment, to go see friends, go on a trip. That third category is guy impacted by higher prices, and you will higher gas prices, and that will come down. That said, when we look at miles in total, we track about 26 million cars every day. Uh, miles in total are now at or above where they were in pre-pandemic. But it's changed the time of day. So you see less driving and commuting because people deciding commuting is uh, overrated. Uh, but you see more in the last category. I think that will come down some uh, in the next couple months. Commuting is, is definitely uh, overrated. Um, 
In all of this, and you mentioned it earlier in terms of, say, the newer technology that, that you've been dealing with, I want to get your perspective then on how your workforce and your wages have kind of changed as we try and grapple with what the labor market's really going to look like in this time of higher inflation. Well, it's been a crazy couple of years, right? So we started, uh, we had 80% of the people in offices and 20% were remote. Uh, today, uh, it's uh, about still over 90% are remote. We're getting more people back into the office. Not all of them want to commute and come into the office. So we're having to adapt and give cust uh, employees choice. So we were one of the first companies to say, look, you can choose. If you want to come in, you can come in. If you want to work permanently, remotely, you can do that. The challenge for us will be, uh, Alex, is making sure they're still feeling affiliated and they align with our purpose. So it's, it's a little bit easier when you're doing culture in a physical place. And it's not because you got 10,000 people in one building. It's because you do in pods. So we're trying to figure out how do we collect, collect, uh, create these virtual pods to help people still feel affiliated with us. So that will bring turnover down and then we can uh, continue to grow. Tom, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to the next time. Uh, Tom Wilson, Allstate CEO, thank you very much. All right, coming up, we're going to stay with the sell-off here. The Nasdaq 100 really taking a nosedive here, off by 2.5%. Shares of Rivian, a big part of that, taking a dive after lockup period for certain insiders and investors comes to an end. Details on that next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Rivian tanking as some early stakeholders in the electric pickup maker are about to get their first chance to unload shares. All of that as the market continues uh, to trade lower than Nasdaq 100 off by three percentage points. Here with more is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, who is selling Rivian right now? Yeah, I mean, reports over the weekend that Ford is selling a block of shares, which is interesting, right? Ford holds around 12 percent of Rivian. The stock, we're trading at $24 a share, way off from the post IPO high. So it's a really curious kind of time to sell, you know, it seems that they're selling a block reportedly of 8 million shares. They still have, by my count, 94 million shares in their holdings selling at the bottom. Well, maybe the bottom. I, I appreciate maybe. That the stock is well under water. <laughs> Ed, what kind of signal does this send? This is either an opportunity for the retail investors to buy the shares they couldn't buy earlier, or yeah. it's a signal that those closest to the company has have doubts. Yeah, look, this is a stock that, that is sensitive to, to the, all the things we're seeing in the broader sell-off rate, higher rates. It is a higher multiple stock. They've encountered supply chain problems. They have earnings on Thursday that will give us a good lens into how they're managing that. And for the first time, Guy, you and I have talked about this before, investors have choice in this space. You know, previously, Tesla was the only game in town if you're an investor that believes in the long-term energy transition story. Now you've got options. Um, but as I said, the timing's curious. You know, we asked Amazon what they plan to do. They're another big shareholder. You know, they declined to comment on whether they'll sell down their stake. But they said, you know, we're committed to at least working with Rivian. And Amazon, of course, is a customer of Rivian. So it's a complicated stock story. Will the retail investor come in here? Mm -hmm. That's another question. So, Ed, I was doing a lot of prep last week, like calls with different analysts, like, okay, what did I miss in right. the last 15 weeks? And so many of them said... Companies like this, Rivian, Carvana, et cetera, do they go to zero? If you can't deliver any kind of actual free cash flow, who's going to want to step in and buy it? What kind of conversations are you having in relation to yeah. that? Yeah. No, no. I, look, I, I speak to a lot of existing shareholders. Rivian has a balance sheet that m most companies would be jealous of, right? They've got the cash. They are now revenue generating. They are ramping up production. But the euphoria that we had post-IPO reality set in you know they scaled back full year production target to 25,000 units from around 50,000 units that the installed capacity of their factory gives them they're struggling in the real world and that's the, that's it we're struggling with the nuts and bolts of making cars i went to the factory alex i don't know if you saw that mm -hmm, it's did. real it's real <laughs> there's stuff going on there but the equity investor is, is taking a more skeptical view on this company is there a signal to the rest like, if you are Looking at Rivian, do you look at Tesla and say there's an equal problem? Or do you look at Tesla and say these guys are going to be the winners in all of this? They are miles ahead yeah. of everybody else. How do you read well, from one to the other? Well, first of all, I mean, the Tesla in terms of the stock story has not been immune to, to rising yields, right? It's caught up in that 
rates higher multiple narrative. But it also has outdone itself during the pandemic period. It circumvented the supply chain issues that legacy auto and the newcomers like Rivian have frankly really struggled with. It's consistently beat expectations on the top and bottom line throughout this pandemic period. The stock has been under pressure. Um, so again, yep. the question is, when do you come in and buy? Ed, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Ed Ludlow joining us from San Francisco on the Rivian story. The S&P is now trading 4019. This is Bloomberg.